So our scripture today comes again from the book of Luke. We're in chapter 12, verses 49 through 56. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo. And what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. When you feel the wind blowing from the south, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you do not know how to interpret this present time? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may know that I tend to follow what we call the lectionary in preparing our worship services. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. Groups of learned scholars about the Bible have studied and have selected scriptures for each week with readings from the Old Testament, the Psalm, New Testament, and the Gospel. And then over, if we follow the lectionary over a period of about three years, we will have covered or been introduced to most of the major ideas of the Bible. Now, the selected scriptures each week usually have a thematic connection, although sometimes it's a stretch of interpretation, at least from my view. Sometimes we come across a passage that I just ra say, I'd rather not. And uh, this is one of those today. You know, it's nice to study and discuss grace and forgiveness and loving everyone because that's comfortable and pleasant. And today I could have chosen one of the happier texts, like the one out of Hebrews that is about uh, running the race and perseverance. But God has taught me that we need to face these scriptural giants and drawing us closer to God will do that in studying these words, but it's not a pleasant experience. <clears throat> so these words today, don't they just feel so out of character for Jesus? I come to bring division. You know, Matthew says that even stronger, I come to bring the sword. It's a disconcerting statement, and it kind of contradicts everything else that Jesus teaches. And with all of the divisiveness Today, the last thing we really want to hear is a gospel text that encourages more separation from each other. So, come on now, Jesus, old buddy, old pal. You rode into this whole existence here on the wings of angels proclaiming peace on earth. So why are you being so harsh? Well, on the surface of this lesson, Jesus is indeed calling for separation from those we love most who disagree with us. But today, we will exegete this scripture, and that means it's a, it's a seminary word that means that we break it down verse by verse, and we kind of understand what each word and each verse means. And as we dive in, we can come up with some other interpretations. You'll know that, notice that this lesson is a continuation of the teachings of Christ that we have looked at this summer. And in this entire section, there is ample evidence to suggest that Jesus is setting the stage for the eventual outcome of his ministry and for those who follow him. But let's, let's take it a verse at a time. First, Jesus says, I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already healed. <coughs> So what are the attributes of fire? It, it burns the chaff, it burns the waste, it simplifies and breaks down anything it consumes. It purifies metals, so impurities are separated from what is precious. Fire brings light and heat, it's necessary for life, and yes, fire destroys. A forest fire wipes out everything 
and the ground is ready to begin again. Almost always in the Bible when the holy God appears to human creatures, the, there's this imagery of fire. All right. We want the waste and refuse of our life, the trash of ourselves, to be consumed, don't we? And so, yes, Jesus burns away our chaff. We want the dirt of our soul to be removed. And yes, Jesus, purify my heart give, and, and take away the sin and death that enslaves me and restore me into goodness. We've probably all prayed something like that. We need to see the light. Jesus is the light of the world. We need heat to cook our food and keep us warm. And Jesus sustains us and provides for all our needs. For our salvation, Jesus destroys our sins and wipes out our sins so we can begin again. And the corruption of the world is defeated. Yes, Jesus is the fire. And he wants us to burn with energy for his ministry. The fire Jesus wants us to kindle is a fire of change fire of God's active presence in the world. Of course, Jesus is eager to strike that match. I wish it were already kindled. And then Jesus says, I have a baptism with which to be baptized. Now, wait a minute. Jesus was already baptized, but he's changing that meaning a little bit. And talking about that, it's, it's distressing to him. This baptism is cleansing and washing and purifying. It's a new beginning. The baptism he must endure is the, his death for our salvation. And when that happens, all of our sin and guilt is destroyed. Jesus and us are on the other side of holy and pure, and we are ready for life eternal. Jesus took our sins. He underwent judgment on behalf of us. He endured the purification of all of the sin and evil and death. And now he offers us forgiveness and purity and eternal life. And Jesus' baptism was pain and suffering. You know what our baptisms are like. Nice warm water and gooey little babies and happiness and sure and sweet promises of God. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I forgive you. I give you the gift of the Holy Spirit to guarantee your inheritance into God's eternal kingdom. So if we accept the love of Christ in our baptism, then we shouldn't be very surprised when we also experience distress when we think about how that love was accomplished. And then Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring division. Well, ouch. Jesus is not kidding here. We know from our own personal experiences that Jesus is not kidding. He's talking about the first commandment. And what is the first commandment? No other gods before I am. To be Christian, to be a child of God, begins and ends with the first commandment. All the other commandments are just simply ways to elaborate on the first commandment. They explain what it means to love God and to love our neighbor and how we get along with each other. So, who or what is your God? Who do you love more than anything? What do you fear losing more than anything? Who do you trust more than anyone? Now, if your love and trust is in the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, then that's one place. Or are you like a God yourself, loving yourself and your comfort more than anything and fearing the loss of what you love the most and trusting your own wisdom and choices rather than listening to God's holy will? See, that's where division comes in. What does it mean practically? It means that Christians live their whole lives looking for the will of God. Now, if you love someone, what do you do? You love your spouse. You love your child. You try to make them happy. 
You fulfill their desires. Well, if we love God the Father and our Savior Jesus Christ, if we love Him more than anything, then we will lead our lives in such a way that we will please God. So to love God is to keep the Ten Commandments. It's that simple. Jesus' commandments, the Ten Commandments, they are simple. They are beautiful and wise and a blessing for all of us. They, these were given to us to take care of us so our lives would be safe. It's a blessing for us and for all people in our life if we keep them. And it's hard for those who want to consider themselves Christians as if, if being identified as a Christian is a good thing. But there are also those who, who don't love God and who, if it means that keeping and listening to the Ten Commandments is what you have to do. Now, I probably, maybe I've offended you, maybe I haven't. If I'm not, I haven't, I'm about to, okay? So, I think Jesus is talking about this, the kind of division that says, Christians living with unbelievers, and, and they say, this is my life and I'm not going to change, and you just have to accept who I am the way I am. As Christian families having fun together with friends instead of worshiping in the community of faith, you say, this is my day off, this is my holiday, I've worked hard all week. As Christians who embrace lifestyles and earthly values of society and just say, it's changing times, you got to go with the flow. Coveting becomes motivation. Disobedience is called initiative. Rebellion is called change agent. Killing the unborn is called a choice. Sexual promiscuity is called freedom. Greed is called competitiveness. Lies are called perspective. See, that's division. And when Jesus rescues us from the power of Satan and brings us into his kingdom, into his church, he asks and expects that we will love him and trust him. That the thing we fear most is that our relationship with him would be lost. And the Bible is clear. There's only two groups of people. People who love God and keep his commandments and those who hate God and ignore his commandments and do whatever they want. And that's the line. Either Jesus is your God, or you yourself are your God. And if it's Jesus, then we lead our lives according to Jesus' teaching. And we share God's wisdom with others. Jody was a great witness for that. If someone elevates himself, then anything that Jesus expects as a response to his love will be upsetting to that person because they want to live their own by their own standards. And they will even manipulate their thinking and actions to fit into a revised model of what they think Christianity is. I'm going to bend the rules so that what I'm doing isn't really that bad. The sad and heartbreaking part of this is that we have all been in places and relationships that we've found and lived through division. When parents love God and children do not. When children love God and parents do not. When one spouse loves God and one does not. Then there is division, this deep, deep division which plunges into the heart like a sword and severs the family. And if you've experienced that kind of division, you know how deeply it hurts. When we see loved ones turning against God heading into destruction and rejecting any attempt that we have made to bring them back to Jesus, it just hurts. That was what Jesus is talking about here. And then Jesus' last comment about interpreting the times in our hypocritical nature. Wow. We see the division. We see the storm on the horizon. We know what that is. We see the division around us. And yet, we ignore it. We say, it's too big. The divisions are just too big. There's nothing that I can do about it. Well, those first listeners of this text, of these words of Jesus, they endured broken relationships because they followed and believed in Jesus. 
And now these words of division resonate in our current context. Because our communities struggle with division, right? In just about every cultural line that we can think of. So it was necessary for Jesus to be very harsh in this case. It challenges us to have eyes to see what is going around us and to activate our heart to respond. Knowing and recognizing and accepting that these divisions exist, you know, it makes us more aware and responsive to Jesus' promise of peace. So we dig through the fire and the baptism, the conflict, the resolution, the, the rejection and the discord. And we find that yes, Jesus does indeed bring peace. That's not that blissful peace when all is good and well according to what we think is wonderful. Oh, we'll get that too. We receive that kind of peace too. But Jesus' peace abides in the division. It abides in conflict. It dwells in us even when we see no peace around us. And that's our salvation. God is really at work in all realities. I ask you to consider that division is really it's not the problem, though. God is actively working on all sides of an issue. Do you believe that? Perhaps human togetherness is not what the gospel is all about. The gospel being alive in each individual person, it does the work it's intended to do. Jesus spoke these words to provoke us. To have a passion, to have a spark within our hearts, and to inflame us, to inflame that spark placed by God. Jesus knew the message of peace and love and hope would create division. A line drawn in the sand because it forces us to choose. So I ask you, to choose today who you will serve.